we have other topics, but let's talk about whatever you watched on Raw this week. I watched oh. it. I think I can't remember too much about it. I remember the end of the main event. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about whatever you saw on Raw. I watched it. I think I can't remember. Actually, those are all words and phrases I was going to use. This, I mean, it, it. It right now they're they're coasting. Um, this it w- was neither a, you know, fast breaking race car to the top or a plummeting, you know, a uh, uh, snow sled to the bottom. This was just kind of we're just chugging right along. Nothing's going to happen here tonight that's really important, and a lot of people aren't even here. But we're going to fill this three hours. And if Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre hadn't come to work that day, this show would have been pretty much a complete loss. So we will spend most of the time of the brief time that we're going to talk about. This was for February 19th, Anaheim, California. There were 13,264 people in the building, according to them. And this is the show that they, how the fuck? Do they keep selling these live event tickets? I can understand why the people are watching TV because the stars talking to you is what everybody's watching for. But God damn, God damn if I don't even know in, in late in my later years here that I want to God damn spend money, leave my house, fight traffic, park, sit in the middle of a crowd to hear the fucking eagles sing at me, much less people talk to me. How do they sell in these tickets, Brian? It's the hot thing right now. It's amazing when it's a show like this, there's no Roman Reigns, no Rock, no, obviously no CM Punk. Cody's a big star, but no Rollins. Doesn't really seem to matter. And the other thing is, even, even when it's a match, typically the women's matches everywhere have a quiet audience for a variety of reasons. But they're watching. Like, WWE fans are sitting there. I feel like they've almost been trained now, finally. Like, if you're going to a Raw, you're going to be a part of that show and see it happen. So they are more willing to accept a lot of things. You get a little bit of action. You may get to see some of the stars. Endless entrances. And because the talent is so hot right now, everything's hot they can go anywhere right now and draw a big crowd meanwhile meanwhile i mean i just saw what aew i forget what town it was it was like a comparison between them it may have have been tulsa because they just debuted in tulsa for dynamite and it was like the last few crowds of wwe there versus their debut it's not an industry-wide thing it's a wwe thing they're hot yeah well and it, yeah, a rising tide does lift all boats in most instances, but to get AEW hot at this point, you would literally have to be able to set fire to an ice cube, wouldn't you? I mean, there's some things that just can't be done. But nevertheless, we'll slander them at another time. Uh, they opened up with Cody Rhodes and Drew McIntyre. And I'm glad they did because I had the most patience at this point at the start of the program. This was the best thing on it. And it still went too long and it was kind of dry at times. Well, that's what I was about to say is it was the best thing on it because it was professionally done. You got two guys that are over. Drew's doing a great job. Cody knows how to put these matches together. I'm getting a little thunder here. If your super hearing starts to goddamn tangle. Um, I don't hear anything. It's all you. Oh, God. Cody knows how to put these things together, keep them interesting. He sells like Ricky Morton, right? You know, with the expression on his face and the dazed look in his eye. And he's got fire on his comebacks or when he fights from underneath. I'm not maligning either of these gentlemen's work or performance in this, it it was broken up twice by breaks, which, you know, disrupts the flow. And then it, they also, they told him, well, you gotta, you guys gotta do the first half hour. 
Because that it was a half the first half hour of the show. It was thirty minutes in by the time they got out of the fucking announcers saying, "Boy, what a match!" So it was it was rough at points. But uh, but of what they do when they do this with other the point is Cody and Drew did what a lot of other people can't do as interestingly or keep keep you with it. They did it. This was the highlight of the show, even if they had to go so fucking long and be broken up. And it's a cold match in terms of the overall scheme of things because the elimination chamber's coming up. So, and that's where they went with it is basically after a number of nice false finishes, suddenly Cody, who you would think is going to win, gets a two count with a cutter and then Uso runs out. He's up on the apron. Cody nails him, goes for the crossroads on Drew, and is the referee still trying to deal with Uso? Solo in the black hood and hoodie and disguise comes to the other apron and from behind spikes Cody. Boom, and he sells it like a million dollars. And then McIntyre hits him with the Claymore, one, two, three. So not only did Cody do the first job since... I don't know when the last time he did a job, maybe to Roman, but it's for Drew, and it was perfect because the bloodline not only cost Cody coming up on Mania, but Drew, whether he, we will come to find out he knew it or didn't know it or claims he didn't know it or whatever, he accepted a win, an assist on the win from the bloodline, his supposed enemy, so he's a hypocrite in his heel metamorphosis the timing that everybody did with this was right it was the right finish it helped everybody it wasn't a meaningless job like you would sometimes see in other situations everybody prospered from this and it didn't hurt cody a bit and i'm just uh, uh, when this was over with i also thought tony khan lost cody and kept moxley good lord but besides being a little long and a little dry in spots, your thoughts? He kind of summed them up. I don't, again, I don't think it was a option between Moxley and Cody, but he probably would have chose. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, it, it, <laughs> this guy is the one that got away and the other guys featured every week. This was a long match. It wasn't exactly exciting the whole time, but you had a big star in there and you had someone who's becoming interesting. This is an example of what I was talking about before. The WWE fans, they don't chant boring, and they don't look bored. No. Well, as a matter of fact, the Let's Go Cody was the chant on their lockup here with him and Drew. And there was a This Is Awesome chant after a, when Drew took over and hit him with a power bomb where he just muscled him right up and hit him with it. The They have... <laughs> I hate to say it, lowered expectations for you mad TV fans out there. They have lowered the expectations, I think, of a lot of the, in, I won't say average fans, because are the average fans the people that buy the tickets? Of, of, of They're dedicated fans. They're just happy to see those guys, as you said, live in person, whether they're speaking or having a fairly safe, professionally done, excitingly put together match, but nobody's going to get fucking killed and there's going to be no uh, outrageous storyline happening in the middle of something where you kind of know there ain't going to be something happening yeah yeah good finish though getting the bloodline involved putting over the spike good finish but then to fill out the first hour of the program i swear I'm, and, and more, actually. They went past the top of the 9 o'clock hour. After a couple of little spots and pitches and a backstage hoo-ha, a women's battle royal that was finally won by Raquel Rodriguez Gonzalez de Molina Jr. And that was, they were already like five minutes past the top of the hour for the finish of the women's battle Royal. So Cody and drew and women's battle Royal. That was it for an hour and five minutes. So this was the ultimate stretch. Get every, everything you can get out of everything. Cause they, 
it just uh, it was like a coasting show, a maintenance show, as Kevin Sullivan used to call it. I mean, there's a there's a stipulation or a an impact on the elimination chamber on this match or that match or she's going to get. But no, it's just we're filling fucking time here. How many it, how many people, how many people do you think watched that segment? Oh, probably. Uh, well, this is raw and uh, football's over, right? Probably what 1.6, 1.7 million. The battle royal was in two different quarters: 1.98 million and 1.95 million. Oh. oh God, what was the overall number then? Uh, hold the on, I got that over here. Overall number was 1.87 million. Good night. So obviously the third hour drug them down again, but um, yeah. yeah, so they got two million people watching a women's battle royal for a half a fucking hour. There is nothing going on on this program, but the people are watching it. And they picked up 100,000 people for the main event. Because <laughs> the last three quarters are 10.15 to 10.30 or 1.76, 10.30 to 10.45, 1.68. And then 10.45 to 11, 1. 1.79. Jeez. That'd, that'd, uh, that'd make Tony a good Friday night program, wouldn't it? Just their fluctuation from quarter to quarter. Did you see the SmackDown numbers? Oh, I think 2.6 million or 7 million or something of that nature. Listen to the last three quarters, just because we did, just did it for Raw here. Last three quarters, 9.15 and 9.30, 2.39 million. 9.30 to 9.45, 2.58 million. 9.45 to 10 p.m., 2.89 million. Jesus Christ. That was for The Rock's promo with the bloodline. Oh. Oh. So uh, The Rock, literally, from the, from the quarter previous to the whole bloodline thing, The Rock picked that thing up almost a Wednesday night rating for Tony Khan. All righty. But back to reality. <laughs> On Raw, where a measly 1.8, 1.9 million people were watching. Then they, after the Women's Battle Royal won by Raquel, they had the sit-down split screen with Rhea Ripley in a refrigerator. And then they had a long hey, package well what, what what do you think of that the i, always, I didn't watch it you know i've always liked the split screen thing ever since the ones they did in world class with uh fritz and rick flair and then for a while they had the face-to-face -face promos on local tv and like 94 yes. what, do you, what do you think of using split screen well i like the the concept of it if it's you know, people that I care about, or in this case, I, you know, care deeply for Rhea Ripley. We got a thing going on. No, you don't. Don't, don't, don't. You know that I'm wrong. Yes, I do. I'm much too strong. All right. Um, I, but I can't stand the refrigerator. She leaves me cold. So I skipped over this, but as a general rule, the split screen, yes. Remember that Watts County used to do the same thing on local promos when the baby faces would be at the desk and then the they would switch to comments directly from the heels about what the baby faces had said or vice versa, but the baby faces were in the at the desk and the heels were in another studio. And actually, if you could... You did that, didn't you? Where you could react to what yes. you're hearing? Yeah. Yes. But if you could see where we were in, in, in the studio at TBS, <laughs> there was like 10 feet difference and it was absolutely open. So we could hear each other anyway. It was just like, but, but it works because you've got volatile personalities that are interacting with each other at a live time or whatever. You know, the idea of the split screen, there's two volatile personalities that, you know, have an issue and they can't be in the same place at the same time, but they can react to each other either in real time or one listens and then responds back and then you go back and forth. What I love that. If it's the right people doing it and they can pull it off, everything's, you know, great. But there's nothing wrong with the concept. There's just something wrong with the refrigerator. Is it tough to do that, though, the reaction shot? You know, you're standing there, you're being filmed, but you're not in the same room, but you have to react to it. No. 
No, I'm not just trying to get the right reaction because you can't really have any action or anything. No, I guess not. Well, no, I mean, you know, you're either you're either listening to what's being said or potentially in some cases, if they've got a budget, you can watch a monitor and see them at the same time. Um, I never had any trouble, but then again, I'm God. And the magnitude <laughs> of me, you know, is such that I would be able to pull it off no matter what the fucking potential ramifications. Well, maybe uh, Nia Jackson. Well, I'll just say about I'm sure you would have liked Rhea Ripley here, but uh, you didn't see. Yeah, yeah, I'd have, I'd have been half happy. And then as they had the, the long, involved thing with about our truth and his judgment day, and I'm skipping through this too because it's all shit we've seen anyway. And then the it's UFC, over. It's it, it, well, it's hopefully, hopefully. Uh, haven't understood it to begin with, and then well, the Judgment Day is about to be in a goddamn eight-man tag team match with mid-card guys. It looks like AEW booking. But did you enjoy seeing the UFC's Michael Chandler? Boy, give that guy uh, a mic every week. <laughs> cutting a promo there at rings, and so <laughs> everybody thought that I was out of my fucking mind when I've said that the UFC has been doing pro wrestling better than pro wrestling has been doing it in, in modern times as far as hyping fights and getting stars over and everything. Now, if they're going to let the UFC guys start cutting a few promos, we might be able to meet in the middle from so dry. You've got to watch it in the rain. to so fucking phony. It's a football bat. You know, not everyone could talk, but this guy was spectacular. This would be an interesting way to promote or cross promote. It's the same company. UFC events, just every now and then on Raw before an event, have one of these guys out there to do a promo before the live crowd. Yeah. Or just even if one of these guys happens to be visiting one of his friends on the roster in the WWE, and now they see him in the back and the guy cuts the promo there. It doesn't have to be, oh, come up from your ringside seat and cut a promo. You know, they can work it into the programming because the, the same company owns both. And... I, t I talked about it, I think, on the air. Certainly we did. It had to be on the air. You and I always record, even when we're discussing the weather. CM Punk, as he makes a transition at whatever point from the ring to behind a microphone or in some other capacity in the business, he's uniquely suited. There have been other, you know, guys that have fought in both the UFC and who competed in the WWE, but they also can't talk and aren't experienced color guys, potentially. He's done everything, and he's done uh, commentary on MMA. So that's going to be a great crawl. And he's an, a star, a name. They've got tons of opportunities now to bring, let's say, the UFC fucking guy. He's got a promising future, but he blows his knee and whatever. He can't handle somebody jumping up and down on his leg for real twice a year, but goddamn, if somebody's going to try to help protect him, same thing, it could, could UFC be the new football like it was in the 60s and 70s? So that's... Although there's I so like many it. opportunities to get some grown men back into business. I did like, though, the fact that he was just there, ringside, he gets the applause, they give him the mic, and then he just starts going... While standing in the crowd, it was a different look. It didn't feel like a setup kind of thing that you would see on Raw. And because of that, oh, yeah, it was effective. Yeah. Well, I know, but that's what I'm saying is that now if they started doing that all the time, then it would get, you know, there's different ways they can have them do anything they want because it's not like if you're a UFC fighter, you're violating your contract by appearing on WWE programming no. anymore. It, it's, yeah, now you have someone to ask for tickets. Yeah. <laughs> so that's... so. Again, Tony's got the pipeline from, you know, Mexico for interchangeable mask guys that nobody's ever heard of and small children from Cucamonga that trained in their backyard on a trampoline. And the WWE will actually be able to draw from a pool of some of the most well-known professional athletes in the business or in, in the business in the country today. Very interesting. You know what wasn't interesting? Monday Night Raw. 
where we had an eight-man tag team contest with Priest and Finn and J.D. Funko and Dominic against R-Truth and The Miz and Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Sameface. And... Yeah, I know that eventually Priest choke slam Truth one two three, but God Almighty, um, I'm just, I'm I I don't want any more our Truth and Judgment Day, and why are they suddenly you know fucking with the mid card people? Well, not suddenly, it's been ongoing, but weren't they supposed to be a big major faction and movement in this industry? Uh, you know. The Judgment Day were the top heel faction when things really started heating up. The Rhea Dominic thing was so hot. It feels like so long ago now. Those two are yeah. not even seen together anymore. And Dominic still gets the booze, but not having Rhea there, I think, has kind of hurt him. And Priest, you know, this was kind of the year you thought maybe he'd be elevated. He's just where he was. Yeah. The comedy stuff's over. And I'll say this, because there's been so many guys to do the comedy stuff in the ring for WWE, like that style. And there's ones I don't like. Like, I'm not a Santino Morella fan. It's too goofy for me, you know? R-Truth pulls it off better than maybe anyone ever. You almost believe he is this character. He's very sincere with it. Yeah, he's believable as this wacky wrestling character. But again, are the Judgment Day a top heel faction? Or are they just a mid-card faction? Because they used to be the top heel faction on the show. The show would open with them doing a promo or confronting another person doing a promo. Then we get, like, promos throughout the show. And then the main event would be a tag or a six-man featuring all those people. That's not what's happening anymore. Who knows why? Well, and I'm sure they saw that of the bunch, of the collection, Rhea Ripley is the star, has the most potential. I'd, I, we've liked to see, or wanted to see, Priest elevated and liked what we saw early on. He's kind of stuck there where he is now. Maybe that's where he's going to be, or maybe it's usage. But I don't think Priest is going to be the guy, whereas Rhea is going to be the the girl. So... Maybe they did, you know, for Rhea and Dominic, it was nice, but Dominic still got the heat for being his own guy. And, uh, you know, Rhea's still in the group, but she's got her own shit going on because they want to cheer the fuck out of her every time she's not with Judgment Day and most of the time when she is with them. So I can see why they separated her because there's the most money in her individually. Should they do something, though, whether it's, you know, just spitballing here, Dominic has a new girlfriend or there's a new girl aligned with judgment day. Just something. Cause if you're going to break her apart from them, there's no one for her to wrestle. There's no one for her to do anything with. So you'd almost have to replace, have someone for her to feud with to end her judgment day thing. Unless she just well, no. lingers on and. Well, well no, it, 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 there doesn't need to be. I think eventually. Unless it's Rhea versus Dominic. What their, probably their goal may be is to, by the time that Rhea uh, is, is there, by the time they want Rhea to be completely away from the Judgment Day, she will be a full-fledged baby face because of what has happened in her world with the other women that didn't have anything to do with the Judgment Day guys or any other guys, and then they will tie up some loose end with Dominic. I don't think they'll even need to address it with Priest or Finn or JD because the only real issue there is with Dominic. And, you know, he might stab her in the back in favor of her, the girl that she's in some issue with at that point to begin with, or just, it, not to join that girl, but just to make his... Feelings known about which side he's on, get some heat, and then he's out of it. You, you, can, you can work that out later on. Well, like we said, you, you're not big on it. It's a lot of comedy stuff, but it held those fans. I mean, the fans there were into it. They oh, were, I know. These, they were these reacting. People, they're strapped down like they're sitting in old Sparky. Come on. They can't get up. 
Uh, and then we got to watch a, a package of the three million uh, people drawing segment from SmackDown of the Rock and the Bloodline. And that's where the people that came to watch Raw are now watching goddamn the screen for they're watching television in the arena. And then we were two hours into the program with what we've just talked about, ladies and gentlemen. Obviously, the little spots and the little bells and whistles and tickles and things and a few backstage uh, soliloquies, but that was the meat of the matter to what people have, have seen in the building so far. And then here comes Becky Lynch at 5 minutes to 10 Eastern. And she's going to do an in-ring promo where she talks about winning the Elimination Chamber and then fighting Rhea Ripley at WrestleMania and does big promo on Rhea. And Becky Lynch, she can talk, and she's got a wonderful vocabulary. And she used a lot of words here. And this went on for quite a while. And, I mean, yes, again, people are interested, maybe not as interested in everything she had to say as they might have been an hour or an hour and a half earlier, though, by this point in the night. But then... <laughs> After she talked for a while, then here came Liv Morgan. And then now we see what's going to happen. Everybody in the Elimination Chamber. And they're all going to come out with a microphone and start reciting their scripted verbiage. Liv Morgan, then Raquel, then Naomi, then Tiffany, then Bianca. And I wrote, this will not end. And I summarized it with half a dozen bad actresses dressed in ball gowns and sequins exchanging fake scripted verbiage with no real emotion on a wrestling program. And then they got in a fight. As soon as that happened, the refrigerator came out and beat up all of them. Leg dropped all of them, left them all laying there flatter than a plate full of piss. 15 minutes from start to finish of this. You know, the average goddamn half-hour television program of modern times is 22 minutes plus commercials. This was almost an entire episode of Seinfeld. We've seen so many good talking segments lately. This is a good reminder of what WWE has been for 20-plus years. But just one person comes out, then another music hits. Then another, then another. Same thing before we battle Royal, Royal Rumble, Elimination Chamber, Survivor Series. It was, uh, eh, not very good. Woo! Went on for a while. I want to see Meryl Streep come out there and really dig deep and give us some goddamn, give us some emoting. Anyway, speaking of emoting, is that another word for regurgitating? Because that's what I almost no. did. It was Gable versus Ivar. And I know on fast forward, Gable is an amazing athlete. And I'm sure there was some good shit involved in this, but there's only so much time in the day. And, you know, we've seen these guys for the past couple of years. So that means that we don't, because of the way they've been presented, even if they're changing their trajectory, we don't want to see too much more of them. Hey, Gable makes me think of Model Girl. Did you see that video going around a Model Girl taking the bonsai drop from that? Yes. Decks? Yes. <laughs> Where she forgot to <laughs> register. And, and she, Do anything. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, for those of you who may not have seen this, it was on Twitter. I guess it's a fan cam from, was that a house show or? Yeah, I think so. It better have been. I'm sure <laughs> it aired on television. <laughs> but she's laying there and the refrigerator, Jax, is going to give her the big bonsai drop off the turnbuckle. And model girl is laying there with her arms flat at her side. She looks like she's laid out in a coffin and she's completely immobile. And you can tell she's probably scared shitless because she don't get the, we've seen her in the ring. She don't get it. She's never going to get it. She's confused. Poor thing. Somebody's filled her head full of nonsense that she should be doing this. So she's laying there flat as a board, stiff as a plank, completely immobile. And Nia Jax jumps up 
and drops all of her in the bonsai drop, all of her weight on top of the young lady, and but not in a, a stiff way like people would expect, or not in a intentionally reckless way, but like to do the move. <laughs> And the girl doesn't move. She doesn't flinch. She doesn't react. So it looked faker than anything I've ever seen because here's 400 pounds coming down, flying through the air, and boom, lands on this 100-pound blonde girl, and it doesn't move a fucking hair on her head. <laughs> she was so scared that she probably had her eyes closed and was just thinking, oh, my God, my life has come to an end, and she didn't know when it happened. Now, th that kind of thing... If I was model girl, I wouldn't take bonsai number two. Because now that that's gone around, if this was the old days, and that had gone around like that, and everybody saw her no-sell, this fucking big finish that's killed everybody, the next one, she would probably be selling. Man, how are you supposed to sell the bonsai drop? What's the best way? Like, what's appropriate? What's too much? Well, you've got you obviously what would happen if this if it was real when that weight comes down on your chest and stomach, your legs would pull up or shoot up and say, imagine what happens when you get a stiff blow to your stomach. Woof, it doubles you over, right? So your head, your you can't do a sit up because there's five hundred pounds on you or six hundred of Yokozuna or whatever. Your legs can kick up and it, once the, the the landing, you can move a little bit where your arms, if, if they are out, can fucking twitch. And then if the person giving it to you stands up a little bit, you can grip your, grip your midsection and turn over or to start coughing. Like, you know, and you see it on your face that, oh, my God. You don't just lay there completely immobile to illustrate that there was no contact whatsoever and no weight dropped on you you move and react and register however you can i mean yoko or anybody that's doing something like that if they know that somebody is not gonna make them look bad or just be a putz and they like the person they can take care of me as i've said with yoko you wouldn't feel it but you better sell the shit because if you don't, the next time you're going to feel it real fucking good. Because then that makes that person look bullshit as well as you when you don't sell anything and it just looks phony because of it. Maybe she was so scared she asked someone, how do I sell it? And they said, just don't move. And she took it literal and just never well, moved. No, I mean, you know, yes, don't move is often, but not after you get hit with something. Then you're supposed to move. And that, that's the old rib and the fucking, you know, when you got potatoed, <laughs> you moved. No, I didn't fight. I didn't fucking move left. You fucking potatoed me, motherfucker. If he, you know, if you, well, that's the thing. If, if somebody's throwing something at you, punch, drop, kick, you know, kick, whatever the fuck, and you move, then their responsibility level is somewhat mitigated by the fact you fucking moved. Did you flinched or you ducked or you moved or you, whatever the fuck so you got you got caught because you weren't where you were supposed to be and where you were when that guy started throwing that thing that's the defense of every goddamn potato ever thrown you moved all right well the review of nia Jax versus maxine was more exciting than any other review on raw so far moving along moving along um the main event where it's time for the main event after gable and ivar the Intercontinental title match with Gunther, poor Gunther, against Jey Uso. And they ring the bell with 20 minutes left on the air and go less than a minute to the break. And then they're gone for three and a half, and they come back. And again, the main event, it's, it's Gunther. He's almost flawless. What a fucking talent. And it's also Jey Uso. And everything that we talked about last week, it's wrong with him, is still wrong with him this week. But they, they have a professional match. They come back. They do five minutes. They go back to the break. They come back. And they do about another five. And then Jimmy or Jey Uso hits him with a splash off the top rope and covers Gunther. 
And a referee counts one, two, and a ding, 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 the bell is ringing. And you look over, and it's the black hooded figure ringing the bell, but this time it's Jimmy Uso. So the match is not over because he is not, Brian, as you may know, if, if somebody's going to ring the bell, they have to be licensed by the State Athletic Commission. It's a true fact in many commission states, at least back in the old days, nobody could touch the bell unless they were a licensed timekeeper. So I'll have you know that it, at some points to make sure that there was a licensed timekeeper on the premises, my mother was a licensed timekeeper. What? Yes. <laughs> For spot shows in Kentucky that nobody, goddamn, nobody from the athletic commission was going to come to Madisonville, Kentucky, or Rabbit Ridge, or fucking Glasgow, wherever the fuck, right? So, I would be a licensed ring announcer and or timekeeper, or my mom at one point was a licensed timekeeper, and they also, you had to have, this was a $2 license, at, and then they raised it to 5 you had to have a licensed ticket taker and a licensed doorman back in those days. So I think my mom was a doorman and a timekeeper and I was a ticket taker and a fucking announcer. Like an and actual license? Like it wasn't just... Yes, I've she still got a couple of them. I got my mom's fucking timekeeper license. <laughs> but they didn't know who the fuck it was. They did, so you just, as long as you had a licensed person there, then they didn't know whether they were actually doing it or not. At, at, one show, I was the ring announcer, the timekeeper, and the fucking photographer. It, you know, it, well, not one show, but it, it, at one particular spot show I can think of. In Madisonville, I was the only one. And, and then Paul Morton was the referee, and Paul had brought the ring, and there was eight guys on the card. And my mom was the only person selling gimmicks because Donna... Uh, Teeny's niece was selling tickets and Teeny was checking up with the sponsors. There you go. And we, but we had like fucking 12 or 15 licensed fucking people in the building. I don't think I've ever heard that before, that your mom actually was licensed by the state for any of the things she was doing there. Well, that, that's the thing. She wasn't doing any of those things. You didn't have to have a license to sell gimmicks, but you had to have somebody at the show that was a licensed <laughs> So Teeny just got her a timekeeper's license. Anyway. When did that go away? You know, I, I'm going to say by the early 80s, I think they had cut it down to where referees, managers, announcers, and wrestlers was the only people that needed to be licensed by the athletic commission. I'm going to say. But you never know about these things. No. Well, uh, that was raw. Are we still no, in the middle no, of the review? We're, We're still, still in the middle, in the middle, of, the middle of, the of it. Yes, yes. It's we a got hell of a match. match. It's a hell of a match. What a maneuver. Jimmy Uso had rung the bell, and that was a distraction. So Jay goes over and levels a fucking uh, uh, Gunther and then dives on Jimmy and then comes off the top on Gunther, but Gunther lifted his knees and he splashed Gunther's knees and he pinned him one, two, three. And then Gunther left and Jimmy got in the ring and beat up Jay and left him laying. So those those battling Usos, nothing settled in that blood brother rivalry. You think that's going to be WrestleMania? Because we've never had the singles match, have we? Or if I we have, it hasn't been a big one. Well, I think they've almost got to at WrestleMania because what else are these guys going to do at this point? So they're costing each other, you know, shots at championships and blah, blah, blah. And they have it on the big show, one whichever night. And I, I honestly don't know if in six months people are going to want to see it as much as they might want to see it right now. Well, they got a couple months until Mania. They could build it up right for that. I don't know. They don't have. They got. Uh, they got six weeks. Yeah, I mean, for WrestleMania, nothing gets a build anymore, really. So I think they could do enough. But no, th they can. But if they if they were to wait, I don't. I don't believe this is a a thing that will. You know, just age gracefully. I think they probably ought to have that match now. Yes. Yes. That's what I say. Well, that was raw.